He might be someone who shouts at people on a street corner in San Francisco, not unlike many people who shout at people on street corners in San Francisco. If he does that well, is for listeners to decide, enough of them do, so that he is included tonight in this program. His latest book is a three-volume magnus opus, which I helped fold and staple, or perfect bound, actually. The Garrulous Progress, Selected Poems, 2004-2010, which he did not bring any copies of. They don't exist. Of which the SF Chronicle says, contains the work of a poet as beguiling as Dr. Seuss, I give you. Charlie Getter. Yes. Martin, thanks you guys for coming. It's kind of awesome. This is neat up here. <laughs> Let me get my shit together. We uh, got a lot of shows in the next two weeks. We got uh, uh, Saturday after you go to Martin's thing, you should come. We're doing uh, select monologues and character sketches from one of my plays. Place called the Red Poppy Art House in the same, in the city. It's really nice. It's kind of a neat place. It's part of like the map. And then I'm at Lidquake uh, in the Lid Crawl for uh, Asterix magazine. I don't know. Never heard of it. But uh, I'm reading at their gallery. And then Anger Management Revenge at uh, Cafe Paradiso, I think, in Oakland. And then. I'm in a zombie burlesque musical at the end of the month. Where? We'll see. Uh, I'm going to start on bookish. left the dock because all the seals left the dock and I know they're coming back but they don't have to because all the seals might have somewhere else to go maybe they have appointments and commitments maybe they have meetings on rocks where they have to talk and figure out where they have to be all the seals left the dock and they're not coming back they figured out that they have enough not to think what we're all about and what are we about, not what the seals want to think about. And how much time do we have to make choices? Are all the voices we had all that mattered? If I knew, I would say something profound, but I can't. All the seals bailed on us, like Jesus and the world of the rest of us. And I pray, but my words can't find a name to pray to. And I can only hope that hope has wings and carries souls on it, because my soul is small and caught up in, well, caught up in everything. And I can find a way away from everything. But that suggests more than I'm given. And I know that youth equals lies, and time equals times, and nobody in our life will figure out our life out, and my life tells me not enough to inform the rest of it. So why am I on the dock, looking around for a seal, left alone, left where they all should be, where they told me to be, and now they took off, and I hope they come back. Because the seals in San Francisco transcend metaphor. And we know nothing lasts forever. And I'm glad I don't. Because what good would that be? The seals know me. And they're not even seals. They're sea lions. <laughs> and I love you in your way. And I love the sky. It looks the right shade. And I pray the seals come back for selfish reasons, for memories in a foreign language, for Minnesota tourists with cameras, for that weird barking that made this place our place. Sea lion, seal, and gringo like, God tells me to scream, but fuck God. I don't have to say anything because I'm on fire. And my girl may not be true, but she means well. And all the world, it's all going to hell. But that's just my perspective, and hopefully I won't let it be so. 
when we're alive, we're radioactive. But as we go from flesh to bone to peat moss, we become less so. And why can it be measured? Why can some guy at a later date know that around 2008, some guy was here who liked donuts and smoked cigarettes? Anthropology escapes me. It berates me and carbon dates me. And I found that time spent waking are just echoes of a lost dream where some guy in a lab coat cries, although he died of a broken heart, the donuts and smokes didn't help. <laughs> in a path, in a row, all together, here we go, sliding headlong down a slippery slope to, to, when the question engendered existential crises, it could be simply stated by Great Danes or Laurence Olivier's who bark in heart to ghosts, dithering as they do. I dither too. I had not thought death had undone so many. Physics doesn't dither. The line from the singularity to the present day may move through time and space in a relative way, but at no time does space-time say, um, wait, let's think about this. Clocks and watches break, but time doesn't wait. And you don't need the FM band to, to play through your braces to know that gravity always wins. At the end of the desert, it's said I've read there lies the promised land. When you're in the desert, any place not desert has enough promise. Buck Owens played guitar in the desert, and Joshua played a horn. I can't even play drums, which they say anyone can play. And if the world becomes desert and I'm left, I guess I won't be Buck or Josh. But I will blow my horn at the Crystal Palace and watch the walls come down, because that's the nature of walls. And I looked over one in Berlin, and it fell. And they have one in China that people steal rocks from to build houses with. And they built these giant ornamental Islam-inspired arches that Islam-inspired fellas broke down spectacularly. If gravity is the organizing principle of the universe, and that's true, and that's the case, then why is this place so messy? I sit atop a mountain top and hear them talking, but see no faces. And they will speak in a language that is alien to me, in a context that I do not understand, from generations long past, and those that are long yet to be, I sit atop a mountaintop. And if I sit there long enough, it will wear out beneath me, and the sun will expand to envelop me, and gravity and entropy will dance and molecules over exp expand over a wide expanse. And I don't care if your stock options are worth $300 a share. You still have to be nice. Because gravity always wins. And the universe will expand and contract like the heaving chest of a sleeping puppy. And we might be its dreams. Always buy a lottery ticket. And don't think that you're going to win. You are not going to win. Nobody wins the lottery. It's fixed. And the smiling faces of the people who win, they're plants auditioned by the company that advertises for the lottery. Buy a ticket anyway. And keep it in your pocket and look at it and however much it is for spend it in your mind make a budget and give a chunk to charity rebuild your house so there's a basketball court inside and all those people who you like can live there but downstairs so you don't have to deal with them all the time. You have to make a budget. You have to be ready. The stories of the people who win the lottery are so sad. They end up strung out, divorced, dead in a doorway, their eyes sad, their pockets empty. No, you won't win, but buy the tickets. And dream of that place 
which may not be all that it's cracked up to be. People born rich often can't handle it because they miss what's important. Know what's important. And that's hope. If your ticket's in your pocket, you have hope. And you can't buy hope unless you spend a dollar and take a chance. But every day is a lottery. And almost every day you lose. But some days, everything gets ugly and dies. <laughs> Otherwise, I despise the lights that arise from your eyes. You are so full of vitality that speak so softly and plainly. Everything gets ugly and dies. Likewise, I'll find that my eyes will droop and my ass will bounce off the ground <laughs> like a basketball with no air. And I'll get angina, whatever that is. <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> Everything gets ugly and dies, like my mind, which has no time for people who grow ugly and die as my mind has grown jaded by the application of years and tears and the consequence of fears that makes me feel ugly inside. Everything gets ugly and dies, but those eyes that shine on in a secret garden on an afternoon that will end too soon and badly and sadly as everything that gets ugly and dies slowly alone stuck in a hotel room where the fleas bite and the mattress smells of memories of forever's past that pretend and portend that forever's can never come back but they walk away, never grow ugly and die but shine on in an ugly dying mind that loves the forever that ever walks fast and past and far away. Everything gets ugly but those eyes as they turn a corner and walk into a world that grows ugly and dies. So this is it, the end of the all, the secret to summer, the reason for fall, the summit of all our hopes and our wishes, the reason big fishes eat little fishes, the core of the dream of the fly to the swallow, the clue why the Swiss make cheese is half hollow. The why of it, the good and shit, is easy name but tough to fit in a box or frame because everything is caused by the same and that in a name is everything. So this is the song I sing, the song I sing is everything. Everything will come forever, the wait, space and time, the wait is never for change and shape, for give and take, for crying baptisms and Irish wakes, for a hole in the earth to fill up with water, for some guy with no job to marry your daughter. Everything is around us all day, it covers our work, in case our play, it never lets anyone get away, not for a day, not me anyway. And everything holds in all the needs done, the trash and the bills and the dog for a run, the lights come on soon after the sun. It's all about a pound, it's all more like a ton. And it tenders the heart with all the indignant, and it turns the plots from instant to instant, and it powers the roots to make a great tree. But it gives me a heart that's in love with and it's all we have, and it takes it all back, and a check for the tax or a day of the track. It's hard sometimes, everything is. It's hard to get on with the business of living with all its drama, and getting into all the drama of guilt and sin, and life and limb, and left hooks across the chin. Everything's not easy to see when the hardest thing to be is to be. Everything with its details, will, fear, sincere, and hearts and still. The devil lies within those things, and with his fury, security flings somewhere out there, so far beyond repair, from fright to scare to a pit of despair. But there, 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 I'm getting too far ahead. This is all about living, not some tale of dread. So alive, we'll strive, and with help, we'll thrive, and with help and luck, life doesn't have to suck. <laughs> Because everything can be victory. A sunny day with a shady tree. A bus that comes when you first reach the stop. Some lovely young lady in a frumpy top. Everything has been the song all along. My pop philosophy has gone on too long. I wish I could light up a new cosmology. But a task that profound is much beyond me. I can't preach. I can't teach. It's beyond my short reach. So I'll finish my speech without much more. I can't say that everything will be all right. That everything will move to our heart's light. That our vision of future will turn to bliss. That our fit is more than just hit or miss. Everything is the way we all share, how everything works out, is a guess I won't dare, so everything will be as everything is, that's it, that's all. Woo, gee whiz, thank you. <laughs> he's, a, he's a hard guy to contain, you know, next to a plant. Don't even <laughs> You seem to be working around it okay. Come on, another hand for Valor. Uh, that was more than something. See, that's, that's, that's why he can't do slams, because he can't seem to get anything to come in under three minutes. It's just... <laughs>
I'm just getting up in, I'm just getting off the runway. <laughs> that three minute rule can be quite a, quite a gruesome thing. Well, of course, I didn't discuss order of battle with anybody, with anything going into this, but um, I'm just going to go with Hal next. Harry S. Robbins, known as Hal, is a voice artist and screenwriter, best known for his vocal work in the Half-Life series, for any of you people who play Half-Life, and has made a return as the voice of Tinker in Dota 2. He's a prominent member of the Church of the Subgenius, as Dr. Hal and Hal. A persona he voices the narrator in Arise, the subgenius video, and made brief appearance in Grass, his official title within the church is Keeper of Church Secrets. His recitations of the classics in the poetic canon are amazing and delightful to behold. And he's even going to do some of his own poetry tonight. So. For this select audience, he's, he's trying it out here for us, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Holland Howell. Well, thank you for that uh, somewhat confusing <laughs> introduction, but how else could it be? From your website. That's... <laughs> yes, well, you have to, to do things like that. Uh, I understand that uh, the... Um, the thing tonight is to do comic bits, comic poems, and so you should be told in advance that this is an attempt to recall comic uh, lyrics. And, uh, and if they fall horribly still, uh, stiff, and flat, there is something comic in that too. <laughs> so enjoy whatever comedy is there, uh, because there, there may not be a lot, although there's as much as I can, can possibly put in. I also am, I do, as part of my nightclub act, recite other people's poems, but I have not my own poems to memory, and I looked around and I couldn't really find the ones I'd written recently, so these are all old drafts and things that I dug up and, uh, and reshaped. So this first one is... World of my delight, hers to bestow. Mine to acquire, provided that I go along the road of knives a thousand miles or so. Concupiscent joys, hers to confer, mine to have found when I have found her. Let not the fortress and the iron guards deter. Fidelity and love, these she will give. And I receive, provided that I live after I travel through the maelstrom in a sieve. And even as I travel comes another's suit, effortless and slack, brainless and brute. Into his hairy paw drops down the golden fruit. <laughs> if, if you're really lucky, uh, everything lines up just right. Um, this is called Heraclitus, one of those recently restored jobs that I spoke of. Certain things we can't forget, we tell ourselves, no matter what. Suddenly, we then discover they're long gone, and we forgot. Mental structures fall to ruin, weathered by the winds of time, not shored up by beams of memory, scaffolding of rope and rhyme. Don't expect fond recollection to be shared the way you think, or to find the strongest memory equal to the weakest ink. On the landscape, light is changing as the landscape changes too. Still more subtle alterations happen, dear, in me and you. And some of these are probably offensive, so I'll do them next. <laughs> <clears throat> there were two schoolboys once, 
Two boys as different as can be. One was an upright, manly lad, and Thomas Quick was he. Yes, Thomas Quick was neat and clean and courteous and kind. He let no unclean habits mar his body or his mind. No unclean practices shall harm my body or my mind. But oh, the other one, most unlike Thomas Quick, indeed, Samuel Sluggard was, with no initiative or creed, unkempt about his person and bereft of charm and sense, he wasted every moment of his time in indolence. Alas, to see a young man's life consumed in indolence. A good boy and a bad boy. Thomas went to Sunday school while Samuel, idle, stayed at home, a wastrel and a fool. While Thomas saved the pennies he earned raking neighbors' yards, Samuel gambled his and lost his money to his parts. He lost his pocket money to his uncouth, low-born parts. And as the two grew older into young manhood's estate, the lives of both were altered by an accident of fate. Her name was Esmeralda. She outshone the evening star. Her father owned a gold mine and a private railroad car. Thus, Esmeralda's charms were rendered greater still by far. When Samuel and Thomas came a-courting to propose, she requested one condition be met by the one she chose. Whoever makes one million dollars first receives my hand as well. A woman has to have a husband who knows how to buy and sell. Father says this will protect me from the fortune hunter's spell. While Samuel tried to gain his million in the gambling hells so low, Thomas studied the stock market. Noting every ebb and flow, the shares he bought, he sold at profit when the stock did well. With the profit, he bought more shares, learning how to buy and sell. He shunned the uncouth dives young Samuel frequented pell-mell. Now I am worth a million dollars. In no time, our Thomas cried. He got a statement from his broker, and he rushed to claim his bride. Your stock certificate's in order, and your capital is sound. So, Thomas, I am yours. My life's companion I have found. With my million and with you, I see my life's ambition crowned. But what of Samuel Sluggard, who had no industrious ways? In the reeking gin mill, even now he spends his days. By day he rots his soul with whiskey, and his fingers click the dice. At night he sleeps on filthy straw with spiders, ticks, and lice, while up and down his shivering spine run nine platoons of mice. <laughs> if you do as Thomas Quick did, you will surely never fail. Now, children, to the point of my instructive moral tale. Thomas shall sport with angels, singing in the heavenly choir, while Samuel pops and sizzles, broiling in eternal fire. I have an illustrated tract for those who would inquire. <laughs> And here's another one that, whose excesses I hope will be seen in their place and be excused. Rosie was the queen of the Silver Spur Canteen, sweetheart of the men who laid the rails. She, they said she was part Pawnee, but it mattered not to me. For her embrace I traveled many trails. Oh, you did your work all day, and when you got your pay, you saw Rosie and you had to wait your turn. She was the only girl for miles, and so she raked it in in piles. She got every single penny I would earn. 
Left and right, do -si do swing that bustle to and fro. I know you like the wilder side of life, but Rosie, you're as sweet to me as any one could ever be. When I get my steak, I'm making you my wife. She had a wooden leg with carven foot and not a peg, so she could wear her pretty buckled shoes. You could smell her French perfume before you walked into her room to find that sometimes she'd be passed out from the booze. Shake them up, shake them down every time they come to town. Pour out the whiskey for the house. Rosie, be my love, and this I swear by God above, one day I will be making you my spouse. She'd take Mexicans to bed, Irish and darkies, it was said. Polacks and bohunks would be fine, but she wouldn't do Chinese for less than 80 cents apiece. Was Rosie, she had to draw the line. Turn them in, turn them out, let them see you round about. Dance for all the cowboys far and wide. Rosie's got my heart as well as every other part, and someday I will take her for my bride. She had teeth of pearly white, and they all came out at night. She kept them by her bedside in a jar. Her hair was of a golden hue that sparkled like the morning dew, but every now and then her roots was black as tar. Take a turn, take a pass, I forget which eye is glass. Powder and rouge, your mystery. Oh, Rosie, when your corset's tight, your figure's an amazing sight. Someday I'll bring you home to live with me. Rosie liked to laugh and joke, just the same as other folk. It was worth the trip to town to see her grin. But after you hung up your gun, and then you had your spot of fun, in your arms she would weep tears of purest gin. Now she twirls, now she hops, that piano never stops. Just watch her dance and you'll become her slave. Rosie, will you marry me? I know that if you don't agree, before too long I'll be a lion in my grave. Uh, <laughs> How am I doing time-wise, right in there? Uh, all right, well, you want more, then it's more. Um, we'll throw something at you. Uh, this one. Uh, All of the beasts of creation are titled with ancient nobilities. All of the beasts of creation have lineage and long family histories. The cat on the carpet beside you is as old as the rocks of the mountains. Earth's molecules make up her chemistry. Her veins are primordial fountains. All living things are born into their state of kingdom and phylum and pedigree all bear the mark of their houses and blood and display their millennial heraldry. The stripes of the tiger, the pelt of the fox, the veins on the wing of the honeybee, the serpent's bright mail sprawled upon the warm stone are chevrons and armor and livery. We know all the beasts of creation are treasures that crown all the ages. Illumined they dwell in the margins that well line the book of Earth's histories. Ages. Old Saturn was he who devoured his sons, as long as the tale has been related. Though they say he was slain, yet I fear he lives on, with his appetite still unabated. And we owe all that lives our allegiance, our close friends and distant relations, so don't side with that part of the universe which blindly devours its creations. Let me do one more of mine, then I'll do some some others from from real poets. If I can can find it. Uh, yeah, here it is. <clears throat> this is a, this one has an epic reach, if not an epic length. Well, it started 3,700 million years or so ago, when chemicals were mixing in the sea. They kept mixing and kept mingling till they felt a little tingling, and that tingling was the start of you and me. 
Now that stuff called protoplasm in the early ocean's chasm was the first stuff on our planet that would feel. And if what it felt was lonely, it's because it was the only stuff around that would continue not congeal. Yes, back again this limp, liquescent early life enjoyed a pleasant lifestyle of expansion and conversion via chemistry. As it thus experimented, this enormous blob repented and was born again into variety. Life, now differentiated, grew to be more complicated as developed sex and with it individuality. Still, its primal need engenders making way for new contenders after sex, death came to immortality. And the earth world onward spinning outward from the first beginning, piling up millennia upon time's shore, living things grew and divided through the murky deep they glided, each one slightly different from the one before. Soon, trilobites and gastropods and brachiopods and many little creatures crawled on the ocean floor. Jellyfish and slimy worms, all sorts of echinoderms, kept coming back for more. The protochordates and the protoarthropoda did the job of pioneers. Through the countless generations, new life came with new mutations as they formed their blasphemers. Some early beings had one thing for which they're now adored. Those spineless things that had no spines each had a spinal cord. Then it was the age of fishes. Some were tame and some were vicious. One and all they did their part to carry on the vital spark, swimming with a fluid motion through the depths of Mother Ocean in the primal sea's eternal cold and dark. Certain early fish perfected upper, lower, jointed craws, and this upper and this lower are the things that we call jaws. But one brave cross opterygian from that darkness deep in Stygian was the first to leave the ocean for the shore. Eustonopteron decided that he liked it when he tried it, therefore we revere his name forevermore. Oh, Eustonopteron, what gave you the strength to go on? Out of the ocean, onto the land, the fin became the foot and the foot becomes the hand. You brought the world a new dawn, you used an opteron. Species traveled toward perfection via natural selection till the oozing marshy green late Paleozoic bogs with new lifestyles were a hoppin' and a twitchin' and a floppin', newts and salamanders, hoppy toads and frogs. One day, upon the land was laid a hard-shelled ovoid keg. This was nothing other than the amniote egg. <laughs> oh, amniote egg, what a perfect little keg. Out of the ocean, onto the land, camping with the terrestrial band, from the waters no shelter will beg you amniote. Then the reptiles started ruling. I assure you, they weren't fooling when they set about to dominate the land and sea and sky, and their story, so heroic, fills up all the Mesozoic as 120 million years go by. Pelicosaurs and dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, and many little creatures swarmed over all the globe. They flourished and they breeded, and they never found they needed a developed frontal lobe. They were lively and prolific, but then something unspecific and indeed quite drastic made the valiant age of reptiles die. And we like to think their chapter ended helping something after have its time on earth beneath the summer sky. Lastly came the age of mammals, sheep and horses, dogs and camels, and the mammoth and the brontotherium. Finally, in the waning flicker of the Cenozoic, bigger things made room for man who had been born to bury him. Like a puny hairless monkey, still this enterprising, spunky little feller made the critters recognize his mystery. He enslaved them and he slew them. For meat, milk, and fur, he grew them and he wiped the ones he couldn't use from history. Not the tiger in the forest, not the fierce Tyrannosaurus could approach the savagery distinguishing the human herd, yet our sorrow and bereavement still may be our best achievement as we humbly stand before our future waiting for its work. Homo sapiens, what can be our defense? Out of the ocean, onto the land, 
The fin became the foot, and the foot became the hand, and our story continues or ends with Homo sapiens. <laughs> Amen. Recite the poem Leviathan by W.S. Merwin. This is the black sea brute bullying through wave rack, ancient as oceans shifting hills, who in sea toils traveling, who furrowing the salt acres heavily, shoulders spouting, the fist of his forehead over wastes gray green crashing among horses unbroken from bellowing fields. Past bone wreck of vessels, tide ruin, wash of lost bodies, bobbing, no longer sought for, and islands of ice gleaming. Who ravening the rank sea flood, wave marshalling, overmastering the dark sea marches, finds home and harvest. Frightening to foolhardiest mariners, his sighs were difficult to describe. The hulk of him is like hills heaving, dark yet as crags of drift ice, crowns cracking in thunder, like land's self by night black looming, surf churning and trailing along his shores rushing, shoal water boding about the dark of his jaws. And who would moor at his edge and fare on afoot would find gates of no gardens but the hill of dark underfoot diving and closing overhead the cold deep and drowning he is called leviathan and named for rolling first created was he of all living creatures he has held jonah three days and nights he is that curling serpent that in ocean is sea fright he is and the shadow under the earth. Days there are, nonetheless, when he lies like an angel, although a lost angel, on the waste's unease. No eye of man moving, bird hovering, fish flashing, creature whatever, who after him came to herit earth's emptiness. Froth that flanks, seething, soothe to stillness, waits. With one eye he watches dark of night, sinking last. With one eye, day rise, as at first over foaming pastures. He makes no cry, though that light is a breath. The sea curling, star climbed, wind combed, cumbered with itself. Still, as at first it was, is the hand not yet contented of the creator, and he waits for the world to begin. That kind of gets away from the comic theme, so I will end with one that uh, is more humorous in its sardonic way by Dylan Thomas. And thank you, everyone. But how does it start? That's a question. Um, when I was a windy boy and a bit, and the black spit of the chapel fold sighed the old ramrod dying of women. I tiptoed shy in the gooseberry wood. The rude owl cried like a telltale tit, and I skipped in a blush as the big girls rolled nine pin down on the donkey's common, and on seesaw Sunday nights I wooed whoever I would with my wicked eyes. The whole of the moon I would love and leave all the green-leaved little weddings' wives in the cold black bush and let them grieve. When I was a gusty man and a half and the black beast of the beetle's pews sighed the old ramrod dying of bitches. Not a boy in a bit by the wick-dipping moon, but drunk as a new-dropped calf, I whistled all night in the twisted flues, 
Midwives grew in the midnight ditches, and the sizzling beds of the town cried, Quick, whenever I dove in a breast-high shawl, wherever I ramped in the clover quilts, whatsoever I did in the cold black night, I left my quivering prints. When I was a man, you could call a man, and the black cross of the holy house sighed the old ramrod, dying of welcome, brandy and ripe in my bright base prime. No spring-tailed Tom in the red-hot town with every simmering woman his mouse, but a hillocky bull in the swelter of summer, come in his great good time to the sultry biding herds. I said, oh, time enough when the blood creeps cold, and I lie down but to sleep in bed for my sulking, skulking, cold, black soul. When I was a half of the man I was, and served me right as the preacher's warn, sighed the old ramrod, dying of downfall. No flailing calf or cat in a flame or hickory bowl in milky grass, but a black sheep with a crumpled horn. At last, the soul from its foul mouse hole slung, pouting out when the limp time came. And I gave my soul a blind, slashed eye, grizzle and rind in a roarer's life, and I shoved it into the coal black sky to find a woman's soul for a wife. Now I am a man, no more, no more, and a black reward for Aurora's life, sighed the old ramrod, dying of strangers. Tidy and cursed in my dove-cooed room, I lie down thin and hear the good bell's jaw. For, oh, my soul found a Sunday wife in the cold black sky, and she bore angels, harpies around me, out of her womb. Chastity prays for me, piety sings, innocence sweetens my last black breath, modesty hides my thighs in her wings, and all the deadly virtues plague my death. <laughs> Thank you. Three hours, if we let him. I mean, it's great. He's a, he's a, he can do a half hour at Burning Man like that. Just I've heard it and been amazed. Chilling. Chilling. Next up, talk about chilling. We're going to have Carol Denny. She's an award-winning lyricist, guitarist, fiddler, concertina player, fiddlers for Peace founder, curator of the Deep. Poetry Project and editor of the Pepper Spray Times. Uh, she's a 2004 honoree of a former city council for her homeless advocacy and an honorary honoree for civil liberties activism through music, humor, and art by the Berkeley Commission on the Status of Women, winner of the East Bay Express Readers Poll Best Solo Performer for 2002, selected as one of San Francisco Bay Guardian's Best of the Bay featured writer and the Center for Political Song, Glasgow Caledonian University in Scotland. She just got back from a, a folk music festival in Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia, where she, where she comes from, West Virginia. Oh, no. And recently featured in the literary semi-quarterly Out of Bar. <laughs> Indeed, not to mention. And she's a published commentator in local and national Fora, whatever that is, local and national fora. Quoted by Alexander Cogburn, 
She's proud part of the folk this family. <laughs> folk this! Say like Cogburn say it! So, um, this goes on. This is an old time spirit award from the Augusta Music Heritage Festival, voted best female artist in Pirate Cat Radio. <laughs> 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 Whoa! Featured yeah. Labor Fest events, which I went to a Labor Fest event. You gotta go to Labor Fest. You can ride a boat around the bay and sing labor songs. It's cool. Nominated Revolutionary Poets Brigade by former Poet Laureate of San Francisco, <laughs> Jack Hirschman. And most recently and most proudly, and as seen on the little screen, and the big screen too, um, the Chair Olympics. I give you. The Olympic sitting competition. The Olympic sitting competition. Yes. And the chair pillar as well. Carol Denny! Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and the title of this cranky is Unless of Course You Die. Someone catches me 
This is a poem, but also kind of a song. <clears throat> in that I could not help but put some percussion behind it. So it's called You Thought the Books Would Burn. And it's a comment on media. People ripping copper out of walls and lights. Pipes, they know, they know there's something missing. They know there's something wrong. And you, you thought the books would burn, but they just melted. You watched them go, you watched it die, and twist and light a fire and fly. You watched them because you had to. You just couldn't look away, I know. You thought the books would burn, became a flock of stumbling birds. And now no one can recognize the authors or the names, and all the names keep coming back to you. Or is it you, you thought you knew, you thought the books would burn, but now they're footprints and they're everywhere. They fell right through your empty hands and blew apart and no one understands how it came to this, this drunken, blind apocalypse. You thought the books would burn, but they exploded over everything, and phrases, words, and little shards of thoughts that burned in people's flesh. Like bright tattoos, it came to this, because we can't control a thing. You thought the books would burn, but they exploded, they exploded. You thought the books would burn, but they exploded.
think I must have written um, six or seven songs and poems out of it. And I was really hoping that anybody here inspired to write anything at all about that would talk to me so we could do a show. <laughs> and uh, highlight this odd issue, the criminalization of sitting down. Yeah, this is called We Look Like Flowers.
to hear Marvin R. Hemstra, who is an award-winning poet, humorous founding editor-in-chief of the Bay Area Poet Seasonal Review, critic, entertainer, publishes and performs around the world. Poetry forthcoming in the Tower Journal and Amsterdam Review. Roger Hewitt called Marvin R. Hemstra's new collection poet wrangler droll. <laughs> <laughs> who, would, who would ever think? Droll poems, nothing less than a philosophy of poetry, and in the process, a radiant philosophy of life. Oh, look out! Here he comes, Mr. Radiance himself, the one, the only, Marvin Roy. Martin, thank everybody for being here tonight, and especially the three wonderful people who preceded me. These are poems about the perils of poetry from a book called Poet Wrangler. <laughs> if you're a poet, you need a muse. Sometimes it can be a cup of coffee, sometimes it can be a Twinkie, sometimes it needs to be much more complicated than that. How to choose a muse. My last muse ran off <laughs> with a monosyllabic hottie from downtown Omaha. Mm. I struggled on, useless knowing my poetry machine would break down very soon. <laughs> a friend in the know suggested I try a police lineup. Just one visit jump-started her love life for a hundred bucks and a pair of safe sex sunglasses, you can see a museum of sinners and saints. One lineup guy, an ice pick goatee, and a beating bet Midler heart tattoo could inspire slant rhymes, eyes closed, but it turned out he was allergic to ethics and muffins. A dubious muse at best. So I opened myself up to any rhyme or any scheme. Hours without even the hint of a sonnet. I was about to leave, pick up an Elsa Alaska Care DVD on the way home, and resign myself to slow prose and coconut milk <laughs> when a celestial snare drum rolled. And a Deus Ex Machina Talent Scott spotlight hit my consummate muse, tutored in a yurt. Ghost wrote for Gandhi's ghost. Mmm, loves a wild blueberry waffle breakfast, finished off at Oxford, grins a lot. My poetry machine has never felt better. <laughs> Hums like sunrise licks the mountain. <laughs> Thank you. It is election time. And this is a incident taken from life. We were sitting innocently in a cafe, finishing our goulash, when the two people next to us burst into hysterical crying. I finally calmed one down and asked what was the matter. <laughs> I gave a fundraiser. <laughs> the candidate didn't come. <laughs> title of the poem is Frequent Suckers. <laughs> In that second half of the 20th century, both serious scholars and shrink-wrapped nuts stubbornly <laughs> insisted, artistic and literary formats evolve through time, like the subtle sexy curve of a flea's ear. Excuse me, first known example of the ripe and ready one thought repetition poem is Freezing Dawn and Out of Jerky, Prehistoric 
dirt age. This pragmatic pink classic comes down to us through the reassuring glow of oral tradition titled, Don't Be Swallowed. Make a face. Make a face! Make a face. My own humble contribution to this ageless genre. No show, no kiss. Deepest expresso eyes candidate. Didn't come to my fundraiser. <laughs> Didn't come to my fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> Fundraiser. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you travel as much as I do, you realize how many poets are out there. It is beyond anybody's wildest imagination. You lift up a rock, and there is a poet. This is part of the answer. King Kong, big mouth, lord of the wide open mic. My ears hurt. Please, no more poems about the enchanted beat of microwave popcorn. Please, no more poems about the big time ethics. Squeeze, wiped out forever by two ants doing a high five on the delete key. Please, no more poems about afternoon delight on AstroTurf. Please, no more poems, alleged or out to lunch poems, followed by asinine apologies. <laughs> I know it's in here somewhere. <laughs> I know it's in here. It was in here before. I know it's got to be here. Maybe it's that poem I scrawled on the back of my pawn shop ticket. You know what that means? Got my glow in the dark Rolex back. Poem is gone. <laughs> I guess I left that. Poem on my pillow. It would have made you cry. May I suggest just one dazzling, breathing poem out of each open mic mouth? If a poet reads two or more poems and the last poem sucks, which poem will bounce off the walls of my mind till the end of time? <laughs> King Kong. Big mouth, Lord of the wide open mic, please pull the plug. <laughs> this is the uh, title poem of Poet Wrangler. It features five archetypal poets. There's one on the cover, there's four on the back, and the artist is in the audience. Mark Hotchkiss, stand up. <laughs> Poet Wrangler at work. Tonight we have time for just one short poem from each of you. Give it your best. Let's hear it from Willie Chisel. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so I have ten poems tonight, one for each finger. Oh. They're tightly bound in a neat organic sequence, a Gordian slipknot of relentless ecstasy, so oh. just have to read all ten. Time! Next we have Paulette Nazal. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Here is a world premiere audience participation poem that requires everyone in the audience to stretch to the waist. No need. To rush, time! <laughs> Next we have Rufy Cockball. I think Mother Nature is awesome, how about you? <laughs> the title of my poem is Earth Tickle. Get us in the mood, we'll close our eyes for five minutes. We listen. 
ever so closely. We can hear the unforgettable sound of raindrops hitting the lid of an 18-inch pizza box. Time! <laughs> Next, meet Cynthia May. This is the one word, extremely urgent concrete survival poem. It's untitled. Sponge, 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 time. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Harry Bonds. My poem's titled Plato's Squeeze. It begins with a surprise mirror image of the reader, scary, but oh so meaningful. From there we dash to philosophical debate just like that symposium, but with a full bar moving right along. We languish briefly in a cloying moment of self-indulgence. Next, we submerge ourselves all the way under in a spirit of apocalyptic Disney. All the Disney characters bravely face their final destiny without any licensing rights except Pluto. <laughs> then we <with> time. <laughs> what a wonderful group tonight. Thank you all. <laughs> Break from the hysteria called My Best Audience. Where the heaven is my audience? She's painting mandalas on her toenails and reading Jung to Kitty in a bombed out garden. He's doing chin ups after a run around the lake. Didn't trip on a landmine today. Mountain sleeping in. Cougar wiped out in her den. Bighorn ram winks at his rival. Where is my audience? There it is. The kind sky, blue sky. Angels with human pretensions, poor devils. The deep blue sea, especially the jellyfish. <laughs> They've read all my books. <laughs> On quiet, tropical nights, the jellies chant my entire opus from the top. <laughs> Okay, and the, the final poem, which is appropriate since we don't want it to leave anyone stuck in the world of poetry. The title is Tell Them You Are in Rehab. <laughs> Here are 10 easy steps to a poetry free life. <laughs> you got yourself in here just in time. Take a closer look at that picture on your poetic license. We're going to get you out of here and back on the street before you can sit on a sauna. Let's brainwash. <laughs> Step one. Life is a metaphor. No. Life is not a metaphor. Life is a dump. Step two, you are not alone. Robert Frost was a poet too, as well as a bigot. We'll stamp out that poet in you in no time at all. And surprise, very soon, you'll wake up to discover that you have become a better bigot. <laughs> Step three, when you walk through a poem, use your Sylvia Plath's first edition as an umbrella. A little warning, there may be holes in it. Step four. Never wear robin's egg blue spandex during full moon. Step five, never waste your exquisite words when you can pull out your shiny new taser. Step six, chant, inner bard, buzz off if you feel a tonka coming down the track. Step seven, remember your life is only a rubber chicken scratch epic. It is soon forgotten. Step eight, you keep in mind poetry is not a respecter of any person. Step nine, don't be that fly who's afraid to land on an angel food cake just out of the oven. Step 10, this is the clincher. Never forget, never forget for one moment a poet always couplets alone. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Top any of that crap, so <laughs> I won't even try.